Welcome to Reiki Cafe Radio. I'm your host, Christine Renee, and I've got a special guest with us today. We have Victor on, and I'm looking forward to this really dynamic conversation. We're really going to be honing in on that throat shock. We're really going to be honing in on speaking our truth, our passion, our purpose. And I want to invite you, all of our listen listeners, to this conversation with an open mind and open heart. And welcome, Victor. Will you please give us a little bit of an introduction for yourself of what brings you to the show today? Who are you? And then we're going to dive on in. Awesome. My name is Victor Javier Guzman, originally from New York, now living in Canada. Um, I got out when the towers went down. I got to Canada like so many people said they were going to. So I've been in Canada for over 20 years. And I am a Reiki master. In fact, I've studied a bit with you. I do introspective hypnosis, tarot, astrology, coaching, and I run a couple of Zoom groups on uh, hypnosis as well. And I'm a member of the LGBT community. I identify as queer, I guess, or pansexual. And I'm a mixed race Latinx. So my father's Puerto Rican and my mother is British. So inclusion has been a really big part of my life as I have uh, traversed two countries, the US and Canada, trying to find where I belong and trying to speak my truth at the same time while staying safe. Absolutely. So, so happy to be here to talk about this topic. Oh, thank you for being here. And I know that your heart has spent so much time in the very Northern reaches of Canada. I love your videos, um, working with the indigenous communities there. So thank you so much for, for coming on, for giving light to the world on this topic of inclusivity. Tell me a little bit about your story, your journey, your, um, and how Reiki enters into that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll be able to show how you and I intersected through the Reiki summit. I believe it was. But, we, but before we start with that, I'd like to just say a little bit about land acknowledgements. Now, I don't know how much this is going on in the States, but in Canada, often uh, when organizations get together, like a university or government, they make it a land acknowledgement for the land that they're on and naming the indigenous people who were here before. So while I'm not going to make that land acknowledgement today, because it'll actually sort of place me on the map. And uh, right now I'm still exploring, you know, personal safety while being an online person as well with my YouTube channel. So I spent a lot of time in the Arctic in Iqaluit, Nunavut, which is on Baffin Island uh, near Greenland. And because of that, I now have this lens through which I'm seeing life where I'm actually really seeing the indigenous people who were here before us and who are still here today. So I have a challenge for your listeners, and that is to just, you know, think a little more about this, consider land acknowledgements. But in addition, what I'm rolling out for 2024 is acknowledging that even these services that we're providing today, whether it's shamanistic practitioner, whether it's Reiki, um, tarot, astrology, divination, hypnosis, trance, many of these come from original people all around the world. You know, shamanism is all around the world, it was a religion, if you will, of original people. So let's acknowledge that, you know, let's not pretend that we've just invented this. You know, we're channeling it, absolutely. But let's acknowledge our indigenous family who came before us and who's here today as well. Iqaluit really opened me up to a thriving indigenous culture that has a language, that has a land claim. And I can't unsee that now. So it's an integral part of who I am. I love that so much. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because um, I absolutely agree. I think that so much of this wisdom, these practices that are coming to light and coming forward across the board have so many ties back to the indigenous people and to the land itself. And so we want to give thanks and honor and gratitude for those lineages. And I, I, I like to think of myself as 
you know, when the indigenous cultures look seven generations. So I think like seven generations ago, what was going on and what was their prayer? <laughs> what was their prayer for the white people to freaking wake up <laughs> and to honor the land, honor the people, honor nature in and of herself. And, and may we continue to do so. May we continue to awaken and be open to this, this healing work. So thank you for bringing that forward right, right at this get go, right from the start. Thank you so much for that. Yes, and thank you for providing the platform just right out of the gate. Nobody needs to feel guilty about this. Like I want everyone to stay with us today because today's about including everyone. You know, today's we're gonna talk about what inclusion means. And I do believe that white people had a lot of this taken from them. If you went back those seven generations to Europe, you know, cause there's shamanism in Europe, right? But what happened when the church, you know, went through um, the Roman Empire, etc. So yes, and when you do hypnosis, you realize that many people have had many past lives as indigenous people, right? Yes. But we're in these three D bodies now, uh, in this plane of existence and this timeline. So you know, there are multiple facets going on, and I think Reiki is one of the ways that um, and you and I have talked about this. You know how Reiki came through into America and how it is a somewhat uh, white practice right now. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, how do we diversify it? Um, how do we include more people? How do we get more people to attend? So my Reiki journey goes back 20 years, I think. Um, and because I'm very analytical, spirit made sure to send me someone really good uh, that would be able to work with my aura and my chakras and invite me to have a visceral experience that I couldn't deny. Because quite frankly, that is what I needed. And I think that's why I'm patient with other people who don't know whether Reiki works or not. Because, you know, maybe people don't have an experience that propels them into that uh, faith based space, if you will, you know, that energy work does work in the quantum. It does work distance, you know, and it always has, but it's hard for the Western brain sometimes to gra grapple with that. So my experience, um, I went to someone and it was a beautiful experience at the end with my eyes closed. I felt a surge of energy rushing up through my body that was so intense. I had to open my eyes because I never felt that before. And there she is like this by my feet, not touching them. And my 3D brain is like, this doesn't make sense, you know, but it opened me up. And when she first met me, she told me there were a lot of people with me. And my analytical brain was like, oh, you know, I bet you say that to all the Reiki clients. <laughs> but, but she asked if I was a healer and I, said, I, I make music, maybe I heal people with my music, but I hadn't fully grown into that role, like accepted that as part of who I am. So I took Reiki one and two, and it was a good experience. Um, I would say my Reiki one attunement, I was really nervous about not feeling anything, again, analytical mind. And as soon as the attunement started, I heard the words, welcome home. Mm. Beautiful. Little breadcrumbs, enough to keep me going. And I know I hadn't planted it there. So after Reiki level two, I life got in the way and uh, moved up north and I settled on an online Reiki three. This is how I met you because I wasn't fully satisfied. You talk about a lot in your Reiki courses. You know, all teachers are different. Some do a level three with a master's, uh, some it's, it's an extra step and it's just so odd how it can have branched out in so many different ways. But I was left with that I couldn't attune masters for some reason. And it was quirky to me. I was just, I don't understand why I can't do that. I, I question that programming. And then I think I met you through the Reiki summit and you were just like, yep, this happens sometimes. And you were just so easy. You're like, just book an hour with me and like, you know, we'll wrap it up for you and I'll interview you and see where you're at. And it was so, it was such a solution that I needed. And, and it was inclusive. 
like inclusion has a really broad definition. And I think sometimes people get wrapped up. Like we will talk about straight, white, able-bodied, cisgendered people as having possibly an embedded advantage in the world. But um, ultimately we're all one, right? When you do this work, you know, we're all one with source and we're just experiences that source is having. Um, you made ease for me. And then I took the Reiki master with teaching with you. And that was a great wrap up. And now I have tools on how to build my Reiki courses for 2024, which I am going to do. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's worth it. Absolutely. And Reiki is a great stepping stone for a lot of people's other gifts to manifest. And that's what I'm experiencing now, which is amazing. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love mixing modalities. And I love that we need all kinds of voices and um, different bodies and different perspectives and different backgrounds, all acting as Reiki teachers, because yes. I feel like there's so many people out there who are ready to learn and they need to meet the right teacher. And so I, I'm all, I'm like, there's, there's, there used to be not as much anymore, but there used to be very much like, don't create more Reiki teachers because you're going to make competition. And I just don't believe in that. I believe that everyone who's ready for healing, the teacher will present itself. And when you are ready to become the teacher, your students will appear. Like, I just believe that so much. Right. So I, we need people who are of mixed race background and we need people who are LGBTQ plus, you know, people in the space, because when they see it, they'll know that they're, they're safe. Yeah. And so I want to just say, thank you for coming board as like, yes, I'm going to start teaching because I know your students are ready for you. The thank world you. is ready for you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So tell, tell us a little bit more about what drives you? What's this passion underneath it all? Yeah, just going to bounce off of one thing you said, just in case anybody had a reaction to it. Um, when someone says like, you know, we know that your LGBT students like will feel safe with you. It doesn't mean that they don't feel safe with all of you. Right, like it's, totally. It's a, it's a hard discussion to have because unless you're in a community, there's this extra sense of safety. So I want, like, I see all kinds of clients and I'm sure all the Reiki practitioners here, like no one is being accused of not being inclusive or not creating a safe space. You're gonna hear me do these disclaimers without because I really want this discussion to keep going. Totally. And, um, you know, of course we're safe, but it's this extra level. And I can, like, if you've heard the word microaggressions, um, they're just like these little sort of things like they might not be racist or like transphobic or homophobic, but they're enough to make people in the community just kind of like for a second. Yeah. And sometimes people go through life and it's not, I'm not saying the other people intended that reaction, right? We're in a process of awakening. We're in a process of learning. There's so much information out there. You know, what I hope to accomplish today is opening the door to we're going to do a glossary of terms. We're going to like clear up some stuff, right? Because people just want to know, like, what can I say? What can't I say? People have good intentions. Please hear me. But sometimes the impact can last longer, even when the intention was good. And like, like I'm not going to give a specific example, but it's just like a trans person might feel safer to use your word with a trans practitioner and it's not because you're not safe yeah. it's because that trans person adds that added level of lived experience so those types of microaggressions might not occur it doesn't mean that one of them isn't a narcissist and one of them hasn't done their shadow work right just because they're both trans doesn't mean they're going to be friends or they're compatible but in this space of inclusion, the person will feel more comfortable. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. It's kind of like how women feel comfortable in women's spaces. Right. right. And 
Yeah. And if there's a man there, he kind of needs to sit back and not take up all the space. Mm -hmm. It's just like a simple example. Or people with a disability might feel comfortable in the room of folks with disabilities rather than able-bodied people because there's a common experience. Yes. Yes. So in inclusion, it talks about creating a space where all of these different kinds of people can thrive. And it, we don't have to start right with race or gender identity. We can just start with seeing and hearing. Someone pointed out, I put this poem up on my YouTube channel with the words, and I didn't speak the words. And the AI is not going to pick up the subtitles. Uh, I mean, for a, uh, you can see the words, but you can't hear them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I need to put both in there. I need to just think about it. Neurodivergent people. How, you know, inclusion for folks with family members on the spectrum. You know, inclusion is so big. Um, When we move into spaces like race, I identify as half white. So I'm going to use myself as the example. I've had to work on growing up in a system that it has systemic racism. Some people call it white supremacy. I know that's hard to hear, but we've all grown up in it. So I'm trying to undo the colonial mindset that the system has taught me. I have my Latino side. There's like racism and shadism on that side, you know, so I've experienced a lot just within my family. And never mind the fact that most Latino people have lost a lot of their indigenous roots through colonization, where it's almost like we're twice colonized. You know, the Tainos in Puerto Rico were eliminated i mean they're still there they ran into the mountains they're still there yeah but in the 1600s you know it's like let's get rid of that and teach us spanish and then you have latinos like me who didn't even learn spanish so that we would fit into the melting pot yeah yeah it's 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 such a complex issue and i think so many of us We just have to step forward and go recognize that I'm willing to do the work to unlearn the things that don't no longer serve our society and our culture and our families. And, and just coming in with that open hearted space of going, I'm willing to unlearn and relearning the language, the, the, um, the sensitive areas so that I can be hold a more sacred space, a more solid container for my students, my clients, whoever it may be. And that's where I'm continuously putting myself in this position of what do I not, what what may I not know? Because I don't know. (laughs) I can't know what I don't know. And that's why having these conversations is just about like waking up a little bit more. And so like, I might have more experience with the neurodivergent community because My daughter is in that community and I've moved into a co-housing community where I'm starting to look around and going, Oh, I think there's a lot of neurodivergent people here. It's, it's, uh, it, and because of that, I'm now living in a space that's much more diverse in a way than the rest of my very white Montana town. (laughs) Um, Like black African-American isn't even on our birth certificates as an option. That's how little diversity we have in, in this state. And so it's kind of like, I'm constantly, and and it's, it's interesting. Like here I am in a very, um, very, in a community that is not only just very white, but it's also very like pro keeping it one way, one look. And for me to be in that and also say, this isn't normal or it shouldn't be normal. <laughs> and right, quote unquote, should be like this way. And what what can I do and what can I learn? And so I've always found my, myself in spaces of like learning how to be a sexual education facilitator that is very, not only scientific evidence-based backed up research, but also very pro LGBTQ, IA, all of the letters, because if we can come from that space and teach our children that this is okay and acceptable and 
just be open-minded and like, let's just have the conversation instead of being fearful of the conversation itself, which I think is so much of that. That's the throat chakra. Like so many people just want to, st- they don't even know that they want to stay in their own little bubble, but that's what happens. And we yeah. have to find those edges of our comfort zone of going, what makes us uncomfortable about this? And what is the opportunity of learning here? And that's where I'm like, continuously inviting like where's my comfort zone what is someone who's pushing up against that comfort zone but what can I learn from this opportunity if I'm here to be in a learning place being a spiritual being in this human experience how can I learn and expand and what can I how can that benefit my life my practice my students by doing so yeah because that's the whole point diversity benefits us And you've literally pointed out, like, we are going to talk about race, but you've literally pointed out that we can talk about inclusion without bringing race into it. It's Mm -hmm. just another form, and it's a big form in our society. But you just pointed out the diversity because, yes, we see the diversity. You know, we we see it. And the thing about the young kids is, uh, you know, there's an awakening going on and programming is being deconstructed. And gender is just going to be one of those for a while. Why it's threatening to people is, you know, you kind of think about what it was like, you know, for gay people to come out, for lesbians to come out, bisexuals. And now, you know, and we're going to talk about the letters in in a moment. Um, But these, these are people having an awakening, deconstructing gender. And it shouldn't be threatening if you're good in your gender and where the argument goes um i'm going to do a plug for the alchemist on youtube i absolutely love her and she talks a little bit about of it's a little bit of a synthetic timeline so we have this organic thing going on of these young people coming into these bodies and it's more more in line with source because source doesn't have a gender like therefore like non-binary like comes out. We're gonna talk more about that. Um, but just allowing them and not seeing it as the destruction of society. Like uh, heterosexual people, there will always be babies. No one's replacing you like as a species we need to procreate. But I think source is exploring other ways of being. And she talks a bit about that, you know, source has got that heterosexual thing down. It's been part of our progression through evolution as animals, as mammals. But as we become more crystalline and more light beings, we kind of got some more stuff to explore. And it's it's nothing to really be afraid of um, as long as society grows with it. And, you know, and that's the challenge. And that's that's what makes it scary for people to come out, right? Yeah. So there's one thing I want to talk about, um, the article that I sent you about like allyship and privilege about this movement now, which I love to change some of that language because privilege seems to be such a a hot button word. So allyship in itself, almost implies a hierarchy, you know, like that me as a white person can be an ally to a black person. It is a power dynamic there. So solidarity. So we see solidarity, which was a union word sort of coming back to just mean like, you know, like my fellow man, like my fellow worker, my fellow human. Um, So a lot of us use the word ally. Some are comfortable with it. I'm not telling anyone you have to change your language. I was just really interested in that, but more interested in the next part, which is to take privilege, which often hits people like dead on. Boom. You're saying, I have privilege. Well, I was raised poor and I was raised by a single mom or this, that. No, it's not about the person. It's about the system. So we're going to maybe start talking about it as like a system embedded advantage or like a structural advantage and all you you need to know to help you understand there is a structure in place is this short story about new york city where black families were not allowed to buy 
like in the 20s, houses where there were white people. I think it was called redlining. They were pushed into Harlem by the banks. So if the bank controls the mortgages, those Black families couldn't have the wealth that generations of a white family could who were allowed to buy a house in a better area. It's structural, it's systemic. It's not because people are lazy, right? Pe Black people have overcome so much. But in that one example, three generations later, they still maybe don't own a house and the other families are passing on houses to their kids. That's structural, it's not personal. Right. It's just structural. So when we say that, and <laughs> this is the part I always get worried about saying online so that you don't sound like this part, but like I, as much as I've worked on myself, I can still say that I am a racist in the sense that I'm in a racist system that I'm unlearning. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm unlearning it. Things still go through my mind. Right. It's such hard work to do, but because it's in my blood, it's most of my family has aligned with the white side and that's been the plan. You know, no Spanish, you know, like anglicize your name, marry yeah. white. And, you know, my father told me if we married black that it would take five generations to get it back out of our line. So it's systemic in my intergenerational trauma, but yeah. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just acknowledging it. And, um, well, and I honor you for, I look for so. solidarity. <laughs> right. Cause I, I honor that because I, I think that's what everyone is so scared to voice. And here we are throat chakra. It's about yes. recognizing and communicating. These are some of the things that I need to recognize and give voice to, to go. I have been carrying this kind of like a generational curse that is restricting our throat, restricting our truth, restricting us from being the fullest capacity of our authentic divine self. Right. And I have it too. I think we all have it because the systems in place ingrained it in us, at least in generations. Like I can very much say that my grandfather was an absolute racist, <laughs> you know, like they would say things and comments about dating or whatever it was. And, and to even recognize like he's long gone and to see my, my aunts and uncles have conversations about this and see the family line divide of who is going to continue that, that lineage and who's actually seeing it now as a curse. We don't want that anymore. And trying to take those, the language out. And so I, I recently got in a very heated argument over my daughter learning a racial slur. And I was like, that was the, I don't care about the F word. I don't care about any of the swear words, but she is not allowed to know racial slurs. I'm erasing that. And then her teacher actually taught her a racial yeah. slur. And I was just like, you gotta be effing kidding me. <laughs> I am doing my absolute best with it's the knowledge that I have to yes. end it. And here we go. Setup. Here's it's the right. system. So the thing is we all have trauma and then we all have this. Yeah. So something my counselor just helped me see, she said, you stopped identifying yourself as a person with trauma. As I heal through my shadow work that I've been doing, because I see that everyone has it now. Right. And like, yes. this is also me, like coming out to say, like, I'm no longer going to identify myself that way because actually I see how common it is. It's a pandemic. Now it's a continuum. So if we can use continuum for sexuality, for the autistic spectrum, intergenerational trauma, trauma is a continuum, right? Like I explained in that example, some families might have more trauma than others. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a far reach to say that there are intense traumas in communities of color, indigenous communities, you know, trans people of color, they face this in the world. We're not accusing anyone here on the call today of doing that. But if these are your clients to sort of segue, they're coming in with these injuries. Oh, and I right. love that way that you look at that. Like they're coming in with these injuries. Notice mm -hmm. how it's not their fault, but it's their responsibility to heal. And throat chakra asking for help. 
Yes. So, the, you know, I want to create space where, because I feel, and I believe there was a study on this saying that Blacks in the States, you can almost be sure that everyone has some form of PTSD, right? Then how do we reach clients, you know, who need access to healing, right? And inclusion is the way. Um, it's, it's shadow work for not only white people, it's shadow work for able-bodied people, you know? It's, I was living in the North and in Canada, and there's really no accessibility for those communities. So if you're in a wheelchair, you know, and it's like you have the ADA in the States, you can fight for that. It's been around for a long time. I'm sure it's not easy. But when do we start taking accessibility into mind? You know, like um, I heard someone, they got subtitles on their um, podcasting software. Great first step, right? Um, just thinking about it, because I assure you, people in these communities can't not think about it. Right, so I invite people, and I don't know why I've always done this, probably just because I'm from New York, and everywhere else I went, it just got wider and wider, and I would always do demographics at, at the table of any meeting I was in, like a work, how many men, how many women, how many black people, how many Latinos, you know, and, and it's, it's not scientific, but Canada is also, for a country of immigrants, still has a fairly like British um, a background, but you know, Toronto is one of the most diverse cities in the world. Like I think it might even be like the number one city, right? So if people have trauma, <laughs> can do a little logic. And some communities have more trauma than others. And they've been colonized to maybe think that something like Reiki is, you know, the devil's work. And that can be Blacks, that can be Latinos, like there's a lot of programming there. How do we reach these communities? That's my life's work for the next 20 years. And I, this conversation is about getting you to think about it as well. Not yeah. that you're excluding, not having the inclusion doesn't mean you're excluding. So again, like having privilege is not personal, it's systemic. Yeah. So no one's excluding, it's just do you notice that we're not there? Mm -hmm. And when I go into spiritual spaces, I notice who's not there. And I'm just wondering, am I just in the wrong algorithm? <laughs> and I don't know where these groups are or are these spaces? And again, they're not exclusionary, but they could be more inclusive. And the way it starts is by talking to people mm -hmm. who feel that twinge of, mm, I don't know how safe I feel here. Yeah. So well, I, th I, th I think we need to start looking and, and having the self-awareness of going, what are all the authors that I read one demographic? Are all of the podcasts that I listen to of one demographic? Am I, are all of my mentors of one demographic? And I had one of my mentors kind of challenge all of her students and I'm, a good thing that she did. It was a trauma informed coaching yeah. training. And I kind of sat back and like, Actually, my main pr primary mentor in the past was a queer, biracial, like she she tagged off them. And I'm like, and even though that right now, like three years ago, I would say the majority of my students were, you know, 90 plus percent white. Now my spaces are so much more diverse. And the, the reasoning behind it, the reason how I went from having a very typical Reiki practice of being mostly white to having it much more diverse. Like I would say we're, we're at, at this present time, you know, 30, 40% different races, different cultures, different skin color, like different, all of it. It's because we're doing these types of conversations. So even though this might not be the most popular podcast, <laughs> I hope it is. <laughs> right. I hope it is. And it doesn't matter to me because it's reaching the people who need to hear it. And the people who are ready for this type of healing are going to listen and know that like I, Reiki Cafe University is in a position that we're trying to cultivate a more inclusive community. And that's all that I, that's all that from my perspective, I'm like, I've, I've done as much, I'm, I will continue to do as much as I can to 
to make this a safe space for all peoples. And that's how I found you because mm -hmm. I challenged my previous Reiki master. We had to do this thing about ascended masters and I'm like, they're all white, you know? And she gave me one indigenous and, or maybe two indigenous and, but like someone in the group supported me just on the discussion of, you know, why that might be or what we can do or what is an ascended master. And the teacher took it personal and it went south. Um, and, and that happens like, you know, there's no, no bad feelings realized <laughs> my throat chakra is open sometimes saying things because <laughs> I'm from New York and I'm passionate. And I'm Aquarius rising, which now I, I wish I knew that like 30 years ago. Like if anyone knows astrology and, you know, I do astrology charts, uh, Astro 101. But since I'm a Cancer sun and I actually have my Cancer in Mercury and Mars, which just means I'm screwed. It means <laughs> like, like I my core is loving and nurturing the way I speak and the way I demonstrate in the world. But I have this Aquarius, which is just like, I got to tell you this thing and I want to invent this and let me do a YouTube channel. Have you heard about this? Hey, let's talk about this. And with a New York background, that's been a lot for people most of my life. Like, thank God we're in like podcast land where I can, you know, just start my own podcast and just start talking. But um, there's some fear there. And um, as we segue into um, the, just briefly the letters um, of the community, and we'll do a little glossary because I promised that. Um, you know, gay people were fearful, like post AIDS to come out. And in Toronto, people were have trauma from being round up in the bathhouses and like thrown in jail. And, you know, trans people, it seems, you know, black people and indigenous people, like the war has been on them for time immemorial. Like it hasn't stopped. But, you know, trans seems to be the new person to bully and um, it's such a vulnerable community and um, and it's hard you know it's I hope that people can see when I speak about the awakening and challenging gender like on some level if someone felt like the, uh, the under the other gender and they wanted to change doesn't that sound really hard Right. You know, does that, does that sound like someone's going to do like willy nilly to mess up your life? You know, I walked down the street with a trans woman in Toronto's gay district and someone reached out and groped her genitals on the street in our community, right? Because people go there to gawk and we have things like RuPaul, you know, I don't really watch any of the drag race stuff. I know it's, it's, normalizing the gay community but in a way that is very flashy right like look over here look over here and it's you know the pendulum is you know there are some butch trans women out there who are like lesbians like they're not all trans women aren't like putting on big dresses like that some are just very ordinary people right so it it, it does that kind of message and trans women are you know they're really at risk and there's a lot of this synthetic timeline going on about how dangerous they are. What's interesting is you don't hear about how dangerous trans men are, you know, and if one were to think about that, you know, why, why are trans women a threat and trans men aren't, you know, and, and we could do a whole podcast on parsing that out, but Trans people don't really even belong in the LGB community because it's a gender identity, right? So if you've ever heard of the gingerbread person. Um, I have. <laughs> you have? Okay, this is a great way to Absolutely. do it. And you can do this with kids. So we're going to do it with adults. Well, and I think this is, that's, I was introduced to that concept probably 10 years ago when I was taking my trauma-informed sexual education facilitator training. And I, I love, I think this is a great way to have, have the conversation. So I'll let you take it away. So LG and B are lesbian, gay, and bisexual. They're sexual orientations. It's who you're attracted to in your heart. You know, what attracts you. Um, if you look at a little gingerbread person, 
the space between the legs, those that's your sex. You know, most people don't even know they're an XX or an XY. You know, no one really gets tested for that. You know, so someone could have three X's, for example. So we're not even all XX, XY, but we'll just, we'll go with that for the time being. So we have that, the base chakra area is your sex. This is who you're attracted to. And up here, I've heard it's- the forehead, said, for our I've people listening. Said, oh, yes, for the radio, up on the head. Um, I've heard it said this way, and this, if there are kids listening, I still think this is safe enough for kids. Um, your sexual orientation or your heart is who you go to bed with, but in the head, your, gener your gender identity is who do you go to bed as. Mm -hmm. And once I heard that for myself, because I am also trans, so when I tell people that now they think I'm transitioning to be female, but no, I was assigned female at birth. But for me, I was always a man in my head, right? So who I'm attracted to, I've been attracted to men and to women in my heart. That's my sexual orientation. People make this confusion, I believe, because the LGBT community tax on trans at the end, but it is a gender identity is not a sexual orientation. So there are straight trans people and there are gay trans people, right? There are bisexual trans people. There are gay people who are not trans. So what is that word? Cisgender, C-I-S. Now it's just a Latin term. So there's a big hoo-ha around this because a lot of cisgender people are like, how dare you call me cisgender? And if the sex you were born with aligns with how you feel you are, then you are cisgender. If it doesn't align, then you are transgender. Yeah. Cis and trans are Latin terms for um, on the same side and across from. So um, the idea being there are a lot of cisgender people. That just means people who identify with how they were born. It's and not I, a derogatory term at all. At, it's just at all. I'm like, and it's absolutely 100% okay if you're cisgendered. Like, I remember totally. my, my son, who's now 17, he came home probably about a year ago, and he's like, I'm a cisgendered, white, heterosexual male. And I'm like, and there is nothing wrong with that, sweetie. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. It's right. okay. It's not a bad word. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll talk about labels in a moment, but let me just finish the alphabet. Yes. So then, you know, you have Q, which can be queer or it can be questioning. Now, a lot of people, especially here in Canada, oh, they shrill when they hear the word queer because that was a really bad word here, kind of like the N word for, for gay people. And so when you know this and you're speaking to an older person, they shrill when you identify as queer, you know, like, and mm. so I make space for that. I don't use that word. But the younger community, it seems over time that queer has become an umbrella term for all of these. So when I tell you I'm queer, I could be any of the letters. You know, I just came out to at least five people who are watching this podcast because there's people I haven't come out to yet. I'm just under that umbrella. So LGB, sexual orientation, trans, gender identity. Uh, Q, queer questioning, I, intersex, also doesn't belong here. <laughs> it's a genetic condition of that you're not XX and you're not XY. It is neither a gender identity nor a sexual orientation. Sorry, folks, it's a throat chakra call today. So <laughs> this is all I can see it. The A is often asexual. So did you know that there are some people who just don't mm -hmm. feel sexual? So yeah. they're not attracted to men or to women or to trans people and they have relationships. They, that's just their sexual orientation. So it really could be LGBA, <laughs> T, <laughs> I. <laughs> Have them all in their own little categories because it's... Yeah, I'm sorry for those on the radio. I'm waving with my arms because I'm in New York. I'm talking here. I'm make, making an umbrella with my hands. So um, 
the point is with all of that now labels there is a big movement to why do we need all these labels and in a perfect world i would say the same thing i've already said we're all one we're all experience is of source you know and we're all in this together but I'm going to say, because I think there's 1% out there, but 99% of people who have said, why do we need these labels, are straight, white, cisgendered, able-bodied. So I know that times are changing, but labels are also how we find our communities. I just came out today. Like, if there are any trans people listening, you know, please message me. You know, it's how we find each other. Um, even when it's dangerous and I can be stealth and not come out, but a black person can't and many trans women can't. So I'm actually stepping into the space to help my trans sisters because a lot of them, you know, aren't able to hide who they are, you know, who they truly are from the view of the world. Um, and even the term two spirit, um it's not it's a new word it's not it's not an old world word and if you're not indigenous it's really it's not really okay to use it i can say to a friend i feel like i'm too spirit but i know that's not my word so i gotta find another way to talk about it mm -hmm. and two spirit came from a meeting um i'm gonna read it so that i say it correctly from elder M Myra Laramie, this was proposed in 1990 at the third annual intertribal Native American First Nations Gay and Lesbian American Conference held in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. So in 1990, nations got together and they said, how do we talk about this thing that is in so many of our nations? No one could say all, There's so many nations, but it's, it's this thread that seemed to run throughout indigenous culture and they needed a term for it. But back in the day, you know, in your own community, speaking your own language, I don't know what the word was, but here we are today. And so two spirit is a term that um, some people choose to use. And I think for some people it means gay and for some people it means trans. It's not my word, so I can't really speak to it. All I know is it's not, it's not my community to say I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. However, you and I had a discussion offline about where did this non-binary, why are there so my, many non-binary, why there's so many trans people now? Part of it, we talked about the awakening, but my theory is that it's not new at all, that it's actually very old. So when I said we live in systemic racism, we've also been colonized. It's like another way of saying, like my Puerto Rican father has a colonized mind in not wanting to teach me Spanish and wanting me to have all the benefits in the world by not having an accent. Like that's a personal example. Um, so I believe in uh, many of these nations, there were two spirit people, however they were named. I believe they were probably the healers or the shamans. I mean, think about a person who is like holding both genders inside them you know what great wisdom and insight that they can give mm. as a counselor or as a healer or a medicine person i believe they were not treated badly at all i believe that the white man came in and wanted to colonize that into man woman you know penis vagina baby etc and they were seeing something else so put this in your in your thoughts. What if these young people who we've already said are already, they've got this great DNA and they got all this information, these like light workers and these indigo kids, they're remembering that gender is a construct, mm -hmm. right? And not to borrow from indigeneity, but again, we've met, we've had a lot of lives. It's something we're trying to honor. One way to honor that is maybe this isn't new at all. Maybe gender, roles and not to say that maybe 95 percent of people will still fall in these boxes because the 10 down to the one percent of us that are more unique in this way i just heard a podcaster say it and i was so happy straight white guy 
cisgender and he said i think the gay people because of what they have to go through he said i think they were the shamans and again this is not to make you feel any less than you know you've won the lottery in this life if you haven't had this journey but why are these people being further victimized what is so threatening about you know and we're not going to get into surgeries and hormones and all that we can do a podcast on that but I think they're remembering, and I think it's it's just another way of us finding our way back home. Yeah. Well, and I feel it in my heart so deeply, and if anyone resonates with that, like I really want to talk about it more. Um, yeah. To make it safe, and to make it um, sacred, and to make it welcome, a welcome part of our society. Yeah. Let's welcome it back. Well, and I, I definitely feel like when we can look, step back and look at the big picture of going, what is the collective consciousness right now and who, what community is going to help awaken us even further? <laughs> of course, we've got a whole new generation of kids who have this, there that are more awake, that are going to push our systemic comfort zones, our industrialized um, systemic institutionalized systems right so it's like of course they came in <laughs> like of course they of course if you had a bunch of spirit babies previous to coming in and going all right what does the world need now they come in with their their throat chakra open they're like Boo. they are <laughs> they're like let's just talk about this let's just make people a little uncomfortable because when we get into our, we when we do get uncomfortable we have a space to learn and expand and grow right yeah. that's where the light oh. comes in that's what rumi says right yeah. so in these little trigger openings you know and again i really feel like 90% are going to fall into a couple of regular boxes but um let's invite the exploration of the deconstructing of programming. I mean, I believe your listeners are experiencing this in other aspects of their lives, you know? It's, it's why you have so many people applying for the shamanic practitioner program. Like there is an awakening going on. If you have children, they are going to be manifesting that in a way for you because you've chosen it in your soul contract, throat chakra, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I don't have kids. So, you know, my alignment is, is different. Um, this is how I'm speaking out. Um, and that's mostly because I quick note. Yes. Some trans people want to have kids. I never wanted to have kids. And so, you know, I'm child, child free. Some people say, right. And so it's even hard for people without kids. Like that's another demographic that mm -hmm. tries to fit itself you know into our 3d world it's another inclusion piece like single people right when everyone's coupled you know inclusion is so vast and i'm just so excited to have the chance today to explain how vast it is and to not be afraid of it it's actually let the light in you know Beautiful. there's so there's so much untapped potential out there and you know and as practitioners there's a lot of people, you know, looking for, you know, all healing is self healing. So I can't, I always stop myself from saying people are looking for healing and to say people are looking for permission to self heal. Yeah. Right. And yeah. we're the facilitators of that, you know, in some of the services that I'm offering. So um, Victor, tell me, tell me a little bit about how reiki hypnosis your your offerings um how are you hoping to support the queer community um tell us a little bit about what you're offering um how people can reach out to you how people can connect how people can watch your youtubes get fill us in great Oof. well i started studying introspective introspective hypnosis over the pandemic uh, to give myself some additional uh, tools in my toolkit on top of being the Reiki master. And I said, I do beginner charts, Astro 101, tarot reading and coaching. Um, but the introspective hypnosis, while it, it will help everyone, uh, uh, according to your question, um, I do believe that queer people have, you know, and trans people and the BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, you know, there's a lot of past life stuff that we have, everyone has it, but 
there's a lot to unpack there. You know, there are black people wondering, you know, why they have this intergenerational trauma. I mean, we know why slavery, but you know, like how to heal it. Um, the type of modality that I do, you know, the more I study a little bit of shamanism since I met you, I see how shamanic my technique that I studied is more so than QHHT, which is quantum healing hypnosis technique. Got to give a shout out to Dolores Cannon. Mm -hmm. She's one of our elders. I mean, beautiful woman from Arkansas who really showed that hypnosis can do so much more. But the technique that I studied comes from Latin America, from Aurelio Mejia, who's in Colombia. Antonio Sanjo has brought it to the States. And some people might know Alba Weinman. She has a really popular YouTube channel. So there are other things woven into this, like forgiveness, role change. There are elements of soul retrieval, right? You know, there we do scans of the body and um, look for attachments. Um, and we, we bring your pieces together, you know? So when you have inner child stuff, which we all do, but then again, we, we built up this conversation. That's the possibility that some of these other communities might need some extra assistance um, to unpack why our childhoods were so traumatic, um, which then folds into our life. Now, this technique starts in this life. And that's what I love about it, because a lot of the other techniques, everyone wants to go way back to when they were an alien and on Andromeda. And, you know, they're a particle out in space. And that's beautiful. And we can go there if you want. But you keep hearing me say we have this 3D body and we're in this timeline, like right now, this body, this inner child needs healing. So we start in this life and we, we see what we can work on. And then we go to the origins of it, possibly to a past life, you know. And yes, many white people have had lives as witches burned at the stake. I mean, there are a lot of common themes that come up. Why I was so drawn to this work is because of Dolores Cannon, who proved that she could speak to people all over the world and keep a conversation going with someone, right? So she'd do a session in Seattle and this voice would come through like, Dolores, you know, let's continue this chapter of this book you're writing, you know, then she'd go to England and then she would write the next chapter. So in my analytical mind, I'm like, what is she tapping into? What can we tap into? And it's the higher self, you know, it's the quantum and Reiki taps into the quantum and has been doing it, you know, long before people were talking about this other stuff. So I really do believe the healing, the self healing is bringing the soul, you know, into connection with it, with the higher self, with your facilitation. And everyone needs healing and I will work with anyone, but I know that queer people and all of those letters we mentioned today, because they all represent people and indigenous people and black people and people with low income and people on disability, you know, if you can make your sliding scale available, you don't have to pronounce it on your website. But these are ways that we make an inclusive, accessible community. So while I have my prices where they are, you know, there are always sliding scale spots available each month. And I just want to invite everyone to check it out. So you can either go to my .com, but I also have a .ca that's easier to remember. So my company's name is Soul Services .ca, but you can also go to Victor Usman dot com. Uh, I just got the other one easy to remember. And my Arctic YouTube channel from my four years of living in the Arctic. So if you go to YouTube, you find it under fellow worker. And I have like over 160 videos. I just reached 200 subscribers. It's so exciting. Um, and my other channel, which is my baby channel that's growing um, because I've come out to you all today, I can share it with you. It's called Sitting With My Truth. And on this channel, I have put up all of my music because I'm a musician from my previous life. I've had two lives. I mean, this is hard to do this, but like I've literally had two lives. It's amazing. Most everyone gets one life. I've lived two different ways. So all my music's up there and 
now that I've ripped the bandaid off, I'm going to try to start getting in front of the camera and just talking about my truths because some of my truths are going to be yours and some of them are going to be new to you. And thank you for creating a space where I could speak about my truth passionately. And for those that made it to the end, you know, gold star for listening. I appreciate you all so much. Oh, thank you so much for being here, sharing your truth and your wisdom. We'll put all of those links in the show notes. So if you are going, wait, where do I find it? It's in the show notes. They will be linked. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Victor. Um, any last words for us, Victor? I forgot the free gift. It's a chant that I channeled it's just about five minutes. It's for chakra clearing, grounding, and transmutation of grief beautiful so excited because i haven't written something in a long time and now that i'm open and everything's flowing this beautiful chant came through and um that will be available for download absolutely thank you so much for that gift i look forward to sharing it in the show notes and if any if this this conversation resonates i really do recommend um, seeking Victor out. All of his links are below so that you guys can connect. Know that Ricky Cafe University will continue to uh, strive to be as inclusive as possible and a safe place for all. And that's one of our values here as well. So thank you all so very much for listening and we will see you next time. Thank you.